Hello, and welcome to the webinar. My name is Lily Catalano, and I will be acting as moderator for today's coffee chat on competency and decision making. This session is presented by the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council and was supported by the Health Resources and Services Administration, HRSA, of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services under a National Training and Technical Assistance Cooperative Agreement. This information or content and co conclusions are those of the presenters and should not be construed as the official position or policy of, nor should any endorsements be inferred by HRSA, HHS, or the U.S. government. This session is being recorded. This is a one-hour session with time for Q&A throughout. Below the presentation slide, there is a chat box for participant que responses, questions, and technical issues. Please type your questions or technical issues into the chat box at any time during the presentation. If you are having technical issues, you can also count contact the Council's office at 615-226-2292. The PowerPoint presentation and the recording of this webinar will be posted on our website, www.nhchc.org, within three business days. I'd now like to introduce our session speakers, Dr. Lori Lickholm, Clinical Professor of Internal Medicine, Hematology, Oncology, and Blood and Marrow Transplantation at the University of Iowa. Dr. David Rosenthal, Medical Director of Homeless PACT, VA Connecticut, and Assistant Pro Professor in General Internal Medicine at Yale University School of Medicine, and Dr. Annette Mendela, Director of Clinical Ethics at the University of Tennessee Medical Center. Welcome first, Lori. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Lori Lickholm, and I um, have the wonderful task of asking you to uh, tell us a little bit about yourselves. So I'm going to um, ask you to go to the uh, panel um, and uh, tell us about who you are as a profession. Okay, great, thank you. And you can see that there's quite a few others, so maybe at some point you can tell us who you are um, uh, and what you do in addition to um, those, um, t those ones that were recorded. Um, now I'd like to see what your work environment is. Okay, that's great. It looks like the community is, is ahead there, um, but we have a good diverse crowd t today. And finally, um, if you don't mind telling us your age. And again, it looks like wonderful diversity in age, so that's fantastic. Um, I'd like to go straight to the learning objectives before introducing uh, David Rosenthal. So the objectives today, as you can see, are to explore differing approaches and challenges related to competency and decision making, to engage in discussion of relevant case studies, and also to highlight strategies and resources for responding to challenging situations. Now I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. David Rosenthal, who will begin with our first case. Thanks very much, Lori. So briefly, just to give a, a little background, I'm a general internist um, and a primary care physician. I'm the medical director of the Homeless Pact, which is a patient-centered medical home in VA Connecticut. 
Uh, we are located in West Haven, and I show this picture. Uh, that's the building, that brown building in the middle is where we work, uh, and the left picture is where what it looks like during the day. Um, I'm honored to be here. We're going to present, uh, I'm going to present two cases and we'll go through discussion. If you have questions, please feel free to put them into the participant chat. We have a diverse group here on the call um, and it would be great to hear people's views and we'll try to answer uh, any questions you may have as we go through. And then we'll leave some time at the end also uh, to answer any questions that we didn't get to. We have three total cases. The first case is Mr. X. Mr. X is a 61-year-old male Army veteran. He was healthy. He was a healthy furniture repairman until his uh, 50s. He was avoiding doctors, living with his wife and his son who had special needs, until about five years ago when, unfortunately, his wife died from liver failure. And then, subsequently, while he was caring for his son, the son died of a seizure. He became incredibly depressed, increased his drinking, lost his job, and eventually his housing. He then became connected to uh, the veterans care, VA care, through the homeless primary care, which is at our center, and through housing resources at the VA. Because of his previous experiences, he was incredibly fearful and paranoid about all doctors, blaming them for the deaths of his wife and son. Over the next three years of caring for him, he slowly engaged in VA health care and services. He received a small disability and chose to live in a long-term motel. Um, during that time, he was diagnosed with depression, an alcohol use disorder, vitamin B12 deficiency, and slowly over time started to lose function of his arms and legs and was diagnosed with a cervical spondylotic myelopathy. And um, we actually had the neurosurgeons do a C3 through C6 uh, neck laminectomies and uh, surgical fusion in 2005, which unfortunately was unsuccessful in restoring function um, and strength in his arms and legs. He then had significant upper extremity bilateral weakness and spasticity in the muscles in his lower legs, and he sustained countless falls in the community. And throughout his illness and multiple hospitalizations related to both intoxication and these falls and fractures, he still maintains a fierce independent streak uh, and regularly refuses care by home agencies, visiting nursing associations, home physical therapy and occupational therapy, from home social workers, and from home health aides. On multiple occasions, we're informed as the care team by the visiting nurses who he lets in or the veteran himself who will call that he's fallen, but he refuses to seek medical care. He refuses most all medical care and all mental health care and substance use treatment recommendations. So some discussion questions for the group. Um, you know, the first is whether we think he's ever incapacitated by his illness or illnesses. Number two, is he competent to make these poor choices in the setting of his untreated mental illness, which are both depression and alcohol use disorder? And the third, for our care team, what is our duty? Uh, and thinking about the ideas of medical beneficence versus autonomy. So I'll stop here for a second. Um, I would love to invite uh, both Hannah and Annette on the call uh, if they have any thoughts about this case as well. If you have questions uh, in the chat room, please feel free to enter your questions or comments in there and we'll try to repeat them or answer any questions about this particular case. But we'll take a few minutes on this one. And of course, since it's the first case, I will, uh, I'll wait a few minutes for people to gather their thoughts. If anybody has further uh, follow-up questions um, or answers to the discussion question, what people's thoughts are. Please uh, direct your, your comments in the participant chat box, which should be at the bottom of the, of the chat room. So this is Annette speaking, um, and I, this is a, a very difficult case that, um, that David's prepared for us. And I, um, while, while folks are, are thinking about their own comments and questions, I want to highlight something that you, you say here, David, um, is he ever incapacitated by his illness? Um, so it's not so much a question of all or nothing, or, um, but 
at what moments and what for what decisions are we are we asking about is he incapacitated because he's got lots and lots of decisions to make along the way um, and so instead of looking at it globally kind of looking at at each decision that he's facing um, and what would we look for what what would we look for to answer the question is he incapacitated at a particular time so um, yeah, that's a that's a great point, and I, and I agree with you that there are lots of little decisions where his capacity, as we go, it sort of it fluctuates, and certainly, when he is called to give a, a small example, right? There are decisions about where he lives and the and the style in which he lives. There are, are decisions about sort of the care that he is allowed to receive or refuse, and there are, for example, the decision when he calls us in crisis or when. Um, he is intoxicated, has fallen, he will call. Um, there may be someone else in the room who's concerned that he has broken his arm, uh, but that he refuses, um, even while intoxicated, uh, to allow us to call for an ambulance or call uh, for assistance or to come in. Uh, and I think for as our team has sort of approached it, we sort of take each of these, you're right, it decisions as they come and say, you know, when he is intoxicated, he actually, if he is unable to provide reasonable reasons um, that make sense and are consistent with his values about um, why he's refusing the care. Um, if he's able to do that and articulate those things, we have not, we have respected his wishes. At the same time, there have been other cases where he has not been able to articulate those things. Um, and then we have called uh, ambulance and, and allow um, those people to step in uh, and to override his decision making. And that is that what you were kind of thinking about it, those kinds really, of things? It really is, and and uh, and I, I like what you're saying about kind of it, you're you're doing both. You're looking at the individual situation. You know, is is he is he intoxicated? Is he um, has he dipped into a very deep uh, depression at this particular time that's incapacitating? So you're looking at at it moment to moment, but you're also looking at. Um, at the story of a life, for, for lack of a better way to put it, that we're not just looking at um, uh, who he is in this moment, although we are, we're also looking at, at his whole life story and what matters to him kind of in the big picture. So you're, um, you're, you're trying to respect both what he's able to do at the time and who he is as a person. Yeah. And Lori's uh, writing in the chat bar if, if there's anyone in the audience who's sort of encountered a similar situation um, by someone who what we would describe as consistently makes poor choices um, but has shown, um, has shown the capacity to make poor choices frequently um, and is competent, what we should say from a legal definition. We'll get to that later. I believe there are some slides later that, uh, uh, that we'll go through. And if, if not, if there's, if there's some silence, that's fine. We can move on to the second case, and we'll come back to any discussion questions as we move forward. But let's, why don't we move on in the sake of time to move to the second case. Um, and if other people have thoughts, we can always revisit those in the chat box and bring those back up at, at the end with discussion questions. Um, so the next case is also a challenging one and also comes from the VA. Um, this is a different case. This is Mr. P., and Mr. P is a 61-year-old Navy veteran. Uh, again, no doctors until his uh, 50s. He's a longtime bartender. He has hypertension. And he became connected to VA housing and health care in 2016 when he was evicted from a very small room that he was renting for over 20 years after the old owner died and the new owner raised the rent. He was diagnosed when he came in with very high blood pressure. Uh, vitamin B12 deficiency, and a mild cognitive impairment, likely in the setting of chronic alcohol use. Initially, uh, many mental status exams, uh, the MOCA was done, which revealed uh, significant cognitive issues, 16 of 30. With his glasses, uh, it was improved to 23 over 30, and subsequent testing improved, 25 over 30 on the slums. We got an MRI of his brain, which showed periventricular white matter loss and volume loss, and he was extremely forgetful with uh, pretty much everything and any sort of appointments with case managers. 
Because he was difficult to find uh, and often forgetful of appointments and often sold his phones, um, it took over nine months for us to be able to help him move from emergency shelter to transitional housing and into permanent supportive housing through a partnership, uh, the HUD-VASH program at the VA. He was hospitalized multiple times for um, different reasons, but in particular to hypertensive urgency, very dangerously high, high blood pressure, related to non-adherence to his medications. And there was lots of concerns about his safety at his new home. He would keep food in the oven instead of the refrigerator. Uh, there were often electrical devices that were plugged in on top of the stovetop. Um, he was given a diagnosis of dementia after multiple evaluations, and with the help of his case managers, was actually appointed a conservator of person and estate by the probate courts here in Connecticut. He continues to live in his own apartment. He continues to drink beer, uh, and he allows visiting nursing and case managers into the apartment a few times a week. So some discussion questions, um, thinking about this case in relation to the case one, thinking about what was different about this case from case one, in particular, um, the diagnoses, what was different about this diagnosis, was there something about the fact that we he had cognitive impairment and was able to be diagnosed with dementia that made our pathway different in case management? Was there differences in case management, the fact that we had intensive case management um, who were able to help him with housing and that sort of had a longer relationship with him to see sort of his deficits in the house? Were there different standards that we had um, because of his diagnoses? So I'm going to leave it open for thoughts and ideas, and of course we can defer um, most of the answers for discussion at the end. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll give a few minutes for people to sort of think um, and ask any questions or thoughts that they may have. And it looks like Elaine Hess is typing. We'll see. I encourage people to participate in the chat because this is a coffee chat. Hopefully people have coffee or lunch with them. And I'll also open it for either um, Annette or Lori if you have comments. And Elaine Hess comments that case two is more progressive and sustained. Um, versus major depressive disorder and alcohol use, which can fluctuate, um, and we are able to complete a, further, complete a further evaluation and diagnostic workup for case two, which provides further support for assessing his capacity. Thank you. Yeah, that is true. Um, those are definitely true things that we were able to get a lot more of a workup um, because he was accepting of it in many ways. Annette, I might ask you as well, are there things that you noted that are very different in this case than the first case? Well, one of the similarities, and you'll see the similarity with the case that I'll share, is um, a distrust of doctors. But, um, but I definitely agree with Elaine that it sounds like that barrier was something that you were able to overcome to a greater extent in a more sustained way with um, the gentleman in case two. Um, another thing that I'm noticing with, with case two is that um, you were able to, to kind of assess what mattered to him to a greater degree than in case one. It seemed like in a lot of ways what, what the gentleman in case one wanted was largely to be left alone but to be helped in a crisis. And so one of the questions you had to ask in addition to questions about capacity was questions about professional boundaries. Um, whereas in case two, since he was more accepting both of assessment and help, it changed what you were able to provide for him. Does that, does that sound right? Yeah, that is true. And, you know, I, I would argue that one of the major differences, as you say, is, is sort of engagement in care. And I say care sort of holistically, not just medical care, but also social care. Um, the first gentleman really was avoidant not only of healthcare providers, but also didn't want, he, he consistently says he does not want charity um, and does not want help from social workers uh, to help him with his housing. Once he was able to get his small disability uh, and a small pension, 
Uh, he didn't want anybody coming into the house. He didn't want anybody sort of helping him in any way, shape, or form, as opposed to patient in case two, who was very much willing to allow um, social workers into the home and, and assist him with various things. That, that does make sense, and it kind of echoes something that Elaine is saying, that in both cases, um, you're looking to respect their autonomy both in, in, with both gentlemen um, and provide them with the, the, most, the most help that they find helpful um, while also providing them with the least restriction that is, that is safe for them. Does that sound... Yeah, I think that I think that's right. Um, and and least restrictive envir environment as possible. Um, and the question of safety is always the issue um, for a lot of us. And I think in the case of case of um, case one with Mr. X, um, which is not obviously his real name, um, we struggle with his safety. We know he is in a unsafe environment. We know that he continues to make poor decisions around his own self care, uh, and he often calls being unsafe. Um, that said, we know his um, his previous wishes that he does not he w he will only allow us to call uh, in um, in sort of real desperate measures um, when he is really not very safe. So the small things we have to accept as a medical team um, that uh, and that's been the, one of the big challenges with case one is sort of our own um, medical thoughts of beneficence and wanting to do good versus uh, allowing him to have the autonomy to make poor decisions. Um, okay. Well, we will, let's keep moving on to, for the sake of time to the next case. Uh, and uh, of course, um, feel free in the end, um, we'll have more discussion at the end, um, but we'll move on. I'm going to pass the baton over to Annette, who's going to take us through case three. All right. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and um, pull us over to case three, and I've given this gentleman a, a name, um, not his real name, and I'm calling him Pete. He's a 66-year-old gentleman who uh, had been in a, a terrible motorcycle wreck and had sustained multiple injuries, um, although he did not sustain a head injury. He had um, multiple rib fractures, had crushed his pelvis, pulmonary contusions, and pneumothoraces, um, just, just really, really badly hurt. Um, but he was able to talk to us, and he was able to uh, tell us a little bit about himself. He said he was um, a lone wolf. He He's single, never married, no children, um, didn't know anything about whether his family was even still alive. He hadn't had contact with, with any of them and didn't know where they were. He'd been homeless on and off throughout much of his life, and while he was raised in our, uh, our region and had come back to this region, he had spent lots of time um, in, his, in his life in other parts of the country. At this stage of things, um, the care team felt that he had pretty good potential to survive his injuries um, and possibly even have a, a good medical outcome, but it was going to require a lengthy hospitalization, a lengthy rehab stay, and he, if, he did, if he did indeed survive, um, that he would still have some pretty significant deficits. He was oriented to person, but not to place or time. Um, he became oriented to uh, times three later in the hospitalization. He was able to describe his condition fair, fairly accurately, but when we asked him if he was uh, to tell us a little bit about what the physicians were proposing to do for him in terms of treatment, he couldn't say much, but he also didn't want to hear anything more about it. Um, he was clear, and this is why the ethics service was consulted, he didn't want any treatment. He didn't want any rehab, even with a good chance for survival. Um, he said that he doesn't like being told what to do, and he certainly doesn't like being told what to do by doctors and nurses, um, or ethicists, I might, I might add. Um, and he said he did not want to be dependent on anyone for anything at any time. 
he'd spent um, in in the course of his life he'd had moments where he spent his uh, had to spend time in jail he'd been in short-term inpatient mental health uh, on and off he had uh, had another wreck in another state uh, when he was a younger man and had an extended hospital stay and all of these experiences had made him feel like he did not he did not trust anyone who was trying to help him he didn't like institutions he didn't like um he he felt that anyone who said they were trying to help was really just trying to pull a power trip on him and if he was going to have an extended stay in a hospital he would rather die um he did not want to and he certainly did not want to live the remainder of his life in any state of dependency whatsoever And so, of course, this was very distressing for um, for the primary team, and we were concerned about what to do for Pete. So some questions. Do we feel like he has decision-making capacity? And I'm curious to hear, um, now that you've heard three cases, curious to hear from the audience, um, if you think he does, what makes you think he does? And if you think he doesn't, why not? And just, again, first sort of first blush thoughts on the subject. Um, if you think he doesn't, do you think he might regain it? And if so, what steps could we take to try to enhance it? Um, and if not, and we can't enhance it, what do we do then? Who should make decisions on his behalf? And should we consider treating him over his objections? And I, I agree with uh, with uh, very much with uh, David's comment that he does seem to be making decisions that are consistent with the uh, the his sense of himself as a, a lone wolf, um, someone who who and he would say that he sometimes would uh, he would sometimes run with a pack. He, he kind of liked that metaphor. I sometimes will run with uh, with other people who like to do the same things he does, ride bikes and and shoot and things like that. But for the most part, he liked being on his own. And it does, I, it does seem like he had, uh, had sort of set his, set his uh, mind for many years that this was, this is kind of who he is. Um, a, and, a, and a very troubling sort of case, though, because we're, I mean, we're literally talking about, um, literally talking about life and death here in the ICU and what the primary team kept saying is but but we can save him we can save him he's we know exactly what to do um and we don't we we, we think we, this isn't even a case of somebody who's going to be um you know stuck in a bed on a vent um question to me um what are the alternative what's the alternative to treatment and what does that really entail exactly because uh, yeah, um pete may have the idea that he can either um, get treatment and be sort of cooped up in an institution for the rest of his life. But um, but if he refuses treatment, it's not like he's going to um, be beamed up to heaven, you know, like uh, like Scotty on uh, on in Star Trek, right? I mean, he's the the dying process is something that he wants to think about. Lori, great question about palliative care team. Um, and yes, that was something that we um, that we looked at immediately. We do have an excellent palliative care team, and that was something um, that we did we did uh, bring on board one way or another because we felt that the additional support, no matter what direction we went um, in terms of treatment, that we certainly wanted palliative care on board um, to help with pain and symptom management and uh, to support the care planning process. So I hope everyone has, uh, has good access to palliative care uh, where you're working. It's, uh, I, can't, I can't say enough good things about uh, what, what they can do for, for patients and, and also for other uh, care providers. Okay, so we got lots of, lots of folks typing, which is good. So we've got uh, Patty who thinks, yeah, he does have capacity perhaps, um, although we don't, we, we don't necessarily agree with his choice. He's, he's had some pretty severe situations. Um, 
and we would not be, uh, Patty would not be comfortable treating them over his objections. Um, and yet, I, I like your last thing, could we try to establish a relationship? We don't want to overrule him, but is there some other way that we can, um, that we can, we, we don't want to just say, well, either he does and we'll do it, uh, or he does and we won't do it, or he doesn't and we won't, but can we try to establish some kind of relationship? And David, yeah, he was able to clearly articulate that he was going to die um, without treatment. One of the things I wasn't sure is whether he understood whether he was not going to die like right away, that, that the dying process wasn't going to be something that would be necessarily quick, um, which was a concern as well. Feel feel free, by the way, um, Laurie and David, to just unmute and... Uh, and um, talk. Sure thing. <laughs> I, I am here, and this is David. And, and, and my question that I was going to type was going to be, where was he living prior to this? Um, yeah. Prior, so, prior to the accident and the hospitalization. Yeah, so prior, uh, immediately prior, he did have, um, I believe it was a, a, just a hotel room that he had been kind of a, kind of a, um, by the week kind of place, not a by the day, but but also not an apartment. So uh, he and he'd been living there for for a little while. I don't remember quite how long. And the the reason I ask in particular, and I, I'd be curious to know what other people on the call are are thinking. But for me, it it actually does impact sort of what the transition is. As you're saying, we don't know how long the dying process would be. He's clearly can articulate that he knows he might die from. Uh, from withholding treatment. At the same time, I think in some ways it would make a lot of us feel better if we knew sort of what he was going to do, what's the alternative, and where that would be so that we could minimize any suffering. Um, I think that is an important thought to think about. Does you know Is this going to be in the hospital? Uh, is this going to be on a hospice unit? Is this, some, is this going to be at home? What are his wishes, and where um, does this take place? Whether that affects the actual ethical decision, I'm not sure about. I suspect it would uh, affect it, and I think I think you're exactly right there because if um, because before we can it, and and kind of going up to what um, what Patty was saying, we um, we we don't necessarily have to love the decision he's making, but we do have to feel like it is truly his decision, and it's not fear talking, it's not um, lack of information talking it's not um inability to process information talking it's truly truly pete talking um and in order for that to happen he's got to know what the alternative is going to be like he's got to know what he, he knows what he doesn't want but he may find himself um he may find himself meeting his destiny on the road he took to avoid it if what he chooses is hospice and hospice is in a facility, right? And the facility is, right? Um, I, yeah, Lori, could you unmute yourself? I would love to hear you say more. I think you're exactly right. The concept of of authenticity is exactly um, exactly what we're looking at. So could you, um, could you um, unmute yourself and say a little here? Well, I think, hi, it's Lori. I think that this is like classic, um, if you look at somebody's decisions that they're making now, when they're consistent with decisions that they've always made, um, that, you know, he's, he's a person who's never really wanted to be messed with. He has been a lone wolf all of his life. He doesn't now all of a sudden want to be, you know, working with a lot of different people. He wants to be by himself. He wants to make his own decisions. And that's so authentic for him because he's always been like that. And so... I, it makes me question even less what his decision is to, you know, refuse aggressive treatment for his different injuries. But I, I also think that the injuries as described, I think that he's not going to probably live a long time unless, you know, he really stabilized um, mm -hmm. after he was, you know, admitted to the hospital because I don't know that you can have all those injuries um, just speaking medically right? Um, without, you know, dying fairly quickly afterward. It would be sort of a miracle. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, and and the, 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 exactly right. The, the medical problems mean that he's not, he's not going to, we're not talking about someone who's going to be living months. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm it, not even sure we have to worry about where is he going to go next. 
Well, and and uh, and and that that was something that uh, it was important for us all to get together um, in in the same room um, to to talk with the the physicians and also the case manager and also the bedside nurse together with the ethics team to kind of talk about the details because it's not just. Um, it's it's easy to miss these things. It's easy to get hung up on on details that uh, that you may get wrong. And good ethics, of course, always starts with good facts. And so right. we want to make sure we're dealing with the most accurate facts uh, and also a shared set of facts. <laughs> now, I would love to see how many people that are are on, how many of the attendees and participants would agree with you know not treating him versus treating him. Great, and, great and question. And why you would either way. You know, it, is, does anybody on this, um, attending on this webinar, think that he should be sort of forced to be treated? And if you don't think so, it would be great to... Oh, wonderful, a poll. Oh, Thank a you. Poll. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, um, because, uh, and, and, and I will say there were... There were folks in the uh, on the treating team who thought it was just sort of obvious. You know, we should um, oh we should treat him um, even over his objections because he he couldn't possibly be in his right mind. Um, and in and um, wow! Uh, but here we have a hundred percent no of nine people so far so far so is so anybody far. else on this list that, who's still on would you mind continuing to vote yeah please please It'd be really interesting and and david's um point uh, david please feel free to just talk you don't have to don't have to type but um but yeah absolutely. i was mute i was muted i apologize um oh, no. Yeah, I'm just, I was just reflecting on one of the interesting differences about this case, case three from the first two, was obviously the, the environment of the acuity being in the hospital environment after an, a very serious acute illness versus the other two, which are sort of more of the outpatient world of people with declining um, health. Uh, um, and, um, you know, I think that the acuity of the environment I started to type in here was that it really forces... Uh, decision making very quickly <laughs> um, yeah. and it forces the team to really come together uh, all aspects of the team as you were describing to make a make a decision urgently whereas the other ones you actually have some time um, to, to sort of see uh, and sort of you know you make the decision doesn't have to be one decision it's multiple decisions over time and I, uh, I, I work in, a, in the inpatient setting, um, and as I'm looking at, at your work in the outpatient setting in primary care, I, I feel like in some ways it actually you have the harder job um, because in, in one sense, when you've got a very acute situation, um, everyone can kind of come together and, um, and know that this is, this is it, we've got to do it now. But in the outpatient setting, on the one hand, you've got multiple decisions, um, so you, you have what might feel like the luxury of time. On the other hand, things can kind of, um, things can kind of get away from you when you're, you're trying to make, uh, trying to tie things up and they're, and they're slipping away. Is, but, but that's just kind of a sense. What, 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 uh, what do you feel like that, that outpatient setting is like in terms of yeah, absolutely. And I, and I do both inpatient and outpatient work, and I feel the same way, that the inpatient setting for some of these um, uh, ethical decisions, it forces, it's a forcing function um, in many ways for all of us to get together and have to make some very, very serious decisions right away. Um, not always, <laughs> and right. sometimes it takes sometimes it takes multiple hospitalizations and inpatient hospitalizations before you can come to that to the to the to the conclusion of the team. Um, but at least in the outpatient setting, um, they are really hard uh, decisions that are drawn out over the course of months, if not years, um, and um, that's I think sometimes harder for the care team to watch the progressive declines. Um, and sort of deal with the ethical um, issues um, uh, as they're sort of trying to respond uh, to, to people's needs. And I think they're also, um, it, 
you also get a, a larger gray area um, than in the inpatient setting, I think. Um, you tend to get that. Let me ask, um, I, the, those who, um, either those who think that he should be treated um, or those who, against his, over his objection, or those who think he shouldn't, um, or those who are imagining the other side um, and just want to make a case for one position or another, let's get at least one. Um, we've, in fact, we've heard, we've heard why, why not to treat him, right, because it really does seem like a very authentic, um, sort of consistent with the, his life story. Um, what might be an argument for why he should be treated? Um, see if, uh, but is, is anyone, would anyone like to offer that, um, offer something sort of in support of the idea of, of going ahead and, and treating him over his objections? And it looks like Elaine is typing as well. While she's typing, I'll just fill in, you know, I think to the, uh, to play devil's advocate, I could see how, um, certain healthcare providers would take the argument that these are things that he would definitely recover from. These are, you know, uh, some of the injuries, um, at least sort of the broken bones and some of the contusions are things that are very survivable. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that with a little bit of time and some, and, and the right care that he would easily survive this. Um, I, I could, I could see that argument certainly from some of our um, our trauma surgeons here uh, could make that argument. Yeah, absolutely, and that, that was one of the things that many on our own uh, trauma service were, were looking at is these, if, if um, in fact, one, one had said, look, let, let's at least get started um, and see if we can't maybe um, help him to see a life that he, they, they didn't want to force a life he didn't want on, the, on him, um, but to see if maybe they could help him regain a life that he would then come to value. Um, so, and and uh, yeah, his uh, as as Natalie is uh, is saying, and, and kind of Elaine as well, is he he has not been able to articulate what exactly we're looking at. He he's able to say he understands it involves rehab course, and that's all he wanted to know. So it may. Um, it may be that if he learned more about it, um, he would come to come to feel differently. So um, I'm gonna, uh, Emily, please uh, go ahead and continue typing. We're gonna go ahead and um, and uh, move on to the next slide. But I, but I do. Uh, we'll take your comment as soon as you as soon as you finish typing. So um, and 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 anyone else, please uh, please go ahead and um, and type in. We'll. Um, We'll uh, take those comments as soon as they come on up. So when we think about medical treatment, ah, uh, Lori, will will I say what happened to him? Yes, um, I think David and I all want to want to kind of say what happened to each of the patients we were working with at the end. David, is that is that uh, your thought as well? That's fine. Yes. Yeah. Let's do. Yeah. Let's do that. And Emily, um, yeah. I, well, that's true. You know. Um, our own perception of his life as having value um, might be reason and uh, might be a reason to consider um, because we we did certainly perceive um, that he that that his life was of value. But I think you're right. The question is when he leaves our doors and he's living that life and we're not living in contact with that life. How is that going to feel to him on the inside? So. Who decides medical treatment? Um, obviously, it's the patient when she or he has decision-making capacity. And the reason for that, um, but the reason we assess decision-making capacity is sort of twofold. One is if we want to make sure that we're not doing anything to a, to a person that that person would not want us to do. But we also want to make sure that we're not asking the person what they want in a moment when they're unable to make decisions that are, as Laura was saying, authentic. We don't want to ask them when they are paralyzed with fear, um, in ag uh, just in agony um, and unable to think clearly, um, unable to process information, or in some other way unable to sort of process um, process information. So when a patient does lack decision-making capacity, we hope that they've already appointed a surrogate decision-maker um, 
on one of these other designations. Um, and if there isn't one, if the patient has not appointed a surrogate, at least in the state of Tennessee, a physician, um, the attending physician uh, identifies who that surrogate is going to be. Um, Laurie and David, is that how it is in your in the states where you practice as well, where the, the attending physician has to identify who that person is going to be? It is, yes, in Connecticut. Um, in Iowa, I don't think that the attending physician absolutely, I think, I think there's more legal involvement than just the attending physician. Yeah. It, it goes state by state. Tennessee actually has some of the most progressive laws in the country on this, um, where um, in most states there's kind of an order. Um, you, you spouse, if there is one, if no spouse, then adult children and so on. In Tennessee, there is a, um, there is that that uh, sort of list, but in addition, the physician is asked to, to answer the question, who best can speak to the patient's authentic wishes, um, recognizing that sometimes you might be legally married, but, um, but be estranged, or perhaps you're legally married, but your spouse has some dementia, um, or, or something along those lines. And so um, the physician has a great deal of responsibility in, in a case like that. And since we're talking about folks who are homeless, uh, I do want to call your attention to the fact that some, uh, we, we, we may f suspect that people who, uh, who are homeless will not have done, will not have taken this step, um, and, and perhaps not, but look, we don't want to necessarily make that assumption right off the bat because there are lots of, um, lots of vehicles for appointing a surrogate that, that people may have taken, um, taken advantage of. The VA certainly has excellent uh, advanced care planning resources. And, um, and in addition, if, if you all work with HMIS, the Homeless um, Information Management System, um, you may find that they have identified a, a surrogate using that resource, so something to kind of look for. And I was just confirming that Connecticut does have, it's the physician in consultation with the next of kin and then uh, with the following order, spouse of patient, adult son or daughter, either parent of patient, adult brother, sister, and grandparent. But the physician does have some discretion. Yeah, yeah, and it, uh, so so uh, very much like the like the state of Tennessee. So when we think about medical decision-making capacity, we're talking about an ability. We're talking about the ability to do a certain thing, which is to make medical decisions by understanding the significant risks and benefits and also the alternatives to the proposed healthcare treatment as these relate to their values, as these relate to their values. That's important, and it's highlighted so well in the comments you all made about that last case that the decision he was making was of a piece with all the other decisions he had made throughout his life. Um, so, uh, and, and that's why I like that case to talk about this, is he wasn't just weighing um, what the risks and, um, and benefits were, but also he was comparing these to what matters most to him. So adults are presumed to have decision-making capacity unless you can demonstrate by assessing and documenting that they do not. Um, and adolescents and even children can have decision-making capacity sometimes for some decisions. We often use the word competence to, to mean capacity and not to get too um, worried about terminology, but just to make the distinction. Competence is a legal concept. It's decided by a court, by a judge. It can be all or nothing, or it can be for certain things, like in uh, David's case, you had talked about how he, um, your patient had been declared incompetent to manage certain sort of parts of his life. Um, and once a, ju a judge has adjudicated that someone is incompetent, um, that doesn't change until it's been reversed or modified by a court. But we recognize that someone can be legally competent, um, but lack the ability to make good medical decisions, either because um, they have dementia, because they're um, currently intoxicated, uh, or, or lots of other things that um, in, in, uh, in a deep depression or in a psychotic episode, lots of things can in, impair capacity. And so it has to be evaluated in terms of a specific task. Um, so you can be sort of globally incompetent, but decision-making capacity is capacitated or incapacitated to make a particular kind of decision. And it can vary from day to day. Um, lots of us have seen patients, for example, who sundown, who may be 
quite capacitated to make certain decisions at lunchtime, but not by dinner time anymore. And while a judge determines competence, the attending physician assesses and determines capacity. Things that can impair decision-making capacity, things like um, low cognition, certain kinds of mental health diagnoses and renal uh, diagnoses, all of these can, uh, can be correlated with low decision-making capacity, but you wouldn't want to make that determination just right off the bat by looking at, for example, um, a blood glucose or looking at a blood alcohol or anything like that. Um, because we know, again, that uh, patients who are accustomed to certain kinds of medical conditions can actually um, kind of accommodate them and can retain a great deal of uh, ability to, uh, to make medical decisions. Orientation by itself doesn't tell us very much. Uh, so while oriented times one or two or three is a fine place to start, it really doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't get us where we want to go. It's, it's only a starting place. CURA is a, an acronym um, that um, a colleague of mine sort of coined in order to think about the things um, that we need to think about when assessing decision-making capacity so that we're not just looking at someone and saying, um, gosh, this doesn't look good to me, so that we're, we're, we're being more objective. The first and most obvious one is the ability to communicate. And while that's usually pretty straightforward, not always. Um, you may have a patient who is perfectly capacitated, except that they don't speak English or that um, they have to write or something like that. So think about ways of, excuse me, enhancing uh, the ability to communicate if that's an issue. Do they understand relevant information? Um, and it's fine to, ha to offer that information more than once if, uh, if they come to be fully informed during the assessment process, so much the better. So do they understand what's wrong? What kinds, of alter uh, what kinds of treatments are being proposed? What are the alternatives? And most especially, what are the likely outcomes? What is your life going to be like if you agree to this or don't agree to that or reject everything altogether? So what is your life going to be like? Um, for example, with Pete, the fact that he knew he was likely to die without treatment was important, but we, we needed to recognize, we needed for him to understand what his last weeks were going to be, or days or weeks were going to be like, um, in addition to the fact that that would result in death. Can he use reasoning, means to ends reasoning? Um, can uh, the he or she? Can the patient use means to ends reasoning? So not ju it, it's not just are they making sense to us, but does the treatment choice map onto the patient's stated goals? Is this consistent with his or her preferences under the circumstances? Does it sound like them? Um, sometimes I think about if, a, if, a, if someone says, well, I, um, I want to go to the North Pole, but they've bought a, a train ticket going south, um, then we would say they're not using means to ends reasoning. So um, is what they're asking for going to get them where they want to go? And finally, do they have a set of values and goals? Do they have a set, do they have preferences? And are they um, are they applying these in the particular situation they're in? And um, inability to appreciate a situation, or lack of um, lack of values and goals, is one of the reasons that children and and adolescents do, uh, often lack decision making capacity. Is they haven't. Um, they haven't developed a sense of self that's sort of rich enough to be able to make decisions in accordance with those preferences and goals. Um, so just kind of a quick remember that um, patients who have lack, who at one point lack capacity may regain it. They may have the capacity for some decisions and not others. And so you want to really keep in mind how are they now, and can we wait until can we wait for a decision until they've got better capacity before we go turning to some other choice? So these are some of the questions you want to ask. What is the person's current capacity? Are they projected to regain capacity? Is there a surrogate that's already been designated ahead of time? If not, is there someone who's available to make decisions on that person's behalf? or any kind of advanced directive uh, that may be, uh, may be able to tell us about it. But also, what are going to be, like in the case of Pete, what are going to be the, um, the implications 
of overruling the patient. Um, if, if we believe that the patient lacks decision-making capacity, but we also think that overruling the patient would be more traumatic for the patient than, pr than getting the care that we think will benefit them, that's something to think about too, is um, just who makes the decision is just the first step. What kind of decision would be humane to make is the next one. So we want to think about what would the patient say if she was fully herself or he was fully himself right now? Not so much what do they want, but what would they say about what they're facing? Um, if they're unable to, to tell us or if, um, if they're unable to, if we don't have anyone else who's able to, to kind of chime in and tell us about that person, then we think about things like dignity. Uh, extending the patient's life and relieving their suffering and anything else that uh, that we think they'd like to consider. So I'd like to turn it back over now um, to uh, to Lori and other participants and um, see what folks have to say. Hi. Um, so I would love to hear some of your, if you have some questions um, or cases that you um, could maybe summarize and ask about, or if you have cases that are, are similar to those that uh, we discussed today, um, or if you just have any specific questions, um, it would be great to hear them. And Lori, I'll add, you know, I can give some follow-up in the last five minutes here, just on the two cases that were presented oh, while people the are... last five minutes. Wow, it's while not <laughs> It goes quickly, right? These, these, <laughs> it, there's a lot of coffee and caffeine in this chat. But uh, as, uh, as people are thinking or formulating ideas or questions in those last few minutes, just the, the follow-up from the first two cases, you know, in the first case, uh, and Annette, I, I want to hear sort of the follow-up on Pete. Um, in the first que case of the gentleman um, who was living in the motel, fiercely independent, uh, he was determined, we did have a ethics consultation as a team, as an outpatient, and we determined that when he's intoxicated, he was really at times inca incapacitated by his illness. But when sober, uh, he would clearly express the risks and benefits of treatment and uh, understands clearly that his choices and could articulate those may cause him great harm and even death. Um, he never really endorsed suicidality, um, and despite his depression, he really fervently denied that he would ever think about that. And the ethics, uh, our ethics um, panel here and consultation basically said that he, a patient with the capacity, has the right to choose a particular quality of life that's consistent with his values. And um, it may not be that which we um, would choose for ourselves, but um, nor is the safest choice, but uh, we're obligated to work towards his goals and not impose our values um, about the quality of life. Uh, uh, on him, and um, and then in in case two, which was uh, uh, a Mr. P, um, as we had mentioned, the patient with, who had dementia, who actually had a conservator. We're still working with the conservator, who is um, really working with us to keep him in the most least restrictive environment um, as possible, and really support him as he goes. I think we struggle with at what point it becomes um, unsafe for him, but for now he's accepting a lot of assistance and we've been able to keep him in his own apartment, um, which is something that is with his values with a lot of supports and wraparound supports. That's great. Annette, what about your guy? What about Pete? So um, so we, we tried our best to develop a rapport with Pete to see if um, if he would consider uh, accepting some, some early treatment just to kind of extend the possibility that he would think about it. Um, and he did, he did bond with one or two of the nurses, um, but ultimately we did feel that he did have decision-making capacity and that the, uh, and it turned out that the, the bond that he developed with the nurses only convinced us all more um, because he maintained that he did not he did not want treatment and that he would prefer to die. Um, but he was, he was accepting of dying with our assist, not, well, I shouldn't say it that way, with our assistance, with our support, with our, the support of our palliative care team. Um, and he did die in the hospital and he did die on his terms. Um, wow, that's so it great. was, a, it was a, a very, a very bittersweet sort of case. Um, and it sounds like, uh, David, with your cases, you've worked really hard to respect what, what those gentlemen want in their lives. 
Yeah, if we continue. I mean, it, it continues, and I think it's not over for in terms of both of those cases about sort of what the end will be. Um, it's something that we continue to work with um, as we go. Yeah. Well, thanks, everybody, for um, your contributions and for being here today, and thanks to Annette and David um, for all of your contributions, and um, we really appreciate Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining the Coffee Chat on Competency and Decision Making produced by the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. This webinar will be archived on our website at www.nhchc.org within three business days. A link of the archived webinar will be emailed to registrants once it is posted to our website. At the close of this webinar, an online survey to evaluate the session will automatically open in your web browser. Please complete it so that we are able to improve your webinar experience. Please also join us on June 7th for another coffee chat on end-of-life issues. Visit the NHCHC website to register.